Hi, I'm Dr. Mike McInnes. I'm one of the chief educators at Doctors in Training, and I want to welcome you to the Solid Anatomy video on the abdominal organs. Now, this is the second of three videos on the abdominal organs. It's best to watch these videos in order. In this video, we're going to discuss the colon, the appendix, the liver and the biliary system, the pancreas, and the spleen. Now, I'll be back later for a clinical correlation for the end of session quiz, but for right now, I'm going to turn you over to our primary lecturer, Dr. John Phelan, to continue his discussion of the abdominal organs. The large intestine consists of the cecum, the appendix, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, and the anal canal. The ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon surround the jejunum and the ilium. The outer longitudinal layer of muscle of the gastrointestinal tract becomes thin at the proximal end of the large intestine, except for three longitudinal bands called the tinea coli that extend from the cecum to the distal end of the sigmoid colon. Discontinuities in this muscular layer allow segments of the colon to contract independently assisting in mass movement of colonic contents. The tinea coli are shorter than the intestine, so the walls of the colon bulge out into sacculations called haustra. The tinea coli merge into a continuous longitudinal muscle layer at the rectosigmoid junction. Thus, the rectum does not have tinea coli. Omental appendices Small peritoneal sacs filled with fat hang from the colon along its length but are absent from the rectum. They have no obvious function aside from the storage of fat. The cecum is the dilated area inferior to the ileocecal junction that lies in the right iliac fossa. The appendix is an extension from the cecum modified by the Latin word vermiform, which describes its worm-like shape. The cecum is covered by peritoneum on all sides and is thus intraperitoneal, but it has no mesentery. Thus, it is not connected to the posterior abdominal wall and is freely movable. The appendix, however, does have a mesentery, which is called the mesoappendix. The approximate location of the base of the appendix may be estimated by determination of McBurney's point. The cecum is continuous, superior to the ileocecal junction, with the ascending colon, which is secondarily retroperitoneal. Lateral to the ascending and descending colon are the right and left paracolic gutters vertical grooves in the posterior abdominal wall that allow passage of fluids such as blood and bile through the posterior aspect of the abdominopelvic cavity. The ascending colon is continuous with the transverse colon at the hepatic or right colic flexure. The transverse colon is intraperitoneal. Its mesentery is called the transverse mesocolon. The greater omentum is suspended from its inferior border. The transverse colon is continuous with the descending colon at the splenic flexure or left colic flexure, which has a peritoneal attachment to the diaphragm called the phrenico-colic ligament. The descending colon is secondarily retroperitoneal and is continuous with the intraperitoneal sigmoid colon at the left iliac fossa. While most of the digestive tract is found within the abdomen, it terminates in the pelvis. The rectum begins at the end of the sigmoid colon, or rectosigmoid junction, which is found at about the level of S3. The rectum ends at the anorectal junction, at the level of the tip of the coccyx. The superior third of the rectum is covered by peritoneum laterally and anteriorly and is thus 
intraperitoneal. The middle third is covered anteriorly, making it retroperitoneal, and the distal third of the rectum is entirely below and not in contact with the peritoneum. So it is classified as subperitoneal or infraperitoneal. The terminal part of the rectum, which is called the ampulla, is a dilated area for storage of feces. The rectum is continuous with the anal canal, which ends at the anus, the external opening of the alimentary canal. Detailed information on the rectum, the anal canal, and the process of defecation is provided in the Solid Anatomy Lectures on the pelvis. The principal functions of the large intestine are the absorption of electrolytes and water from the indigestible remains of chyme, conversion of the remains to feces, and storage and elimination of the feces. The mucosa of the large intestine has no villi and thus appears smooth at the gross level. However, enterocytes, or absorptive cells, are abundant. Their function is to actively transport electrolytes out of the intestinal lumen. Water passively follows the electrolytes and is also absorbed. Goblet cells, which produce mucus that facilitates the passage of feces, are also abundant in the large intestine, especially distally. The liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas bud off of the embryonic gut tube during development and are all intraperitoneal. All three organs are connected to the digestive tract via ducts. The liver occupies all of the right hypochondriac region, most of the epigastric region, and extends into the left hypochondriac region as well. It reaches as far superiorly into the thorax as the level of the fifth rib. Inferiorly, it does not project much beyond the costal margin, so the liver is almost entirely surrounded by the thoracic cage. The liver has a superior convex diaphragmatic surface and a flat inferior visceral surface. The peritoneum covers most of the diaphragmatic surface and, as mentioned previously, forms the falciform ligament that connects the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. The falciform ligament divides the liver into left and right anatomic lobes, as opposed to functional lobes, which are divided according to blood supply. The posterior portion of the liver that is in contact with the diaphragm is not covered by peritoneum and is called the bare area. The peritoneum at the anterior and posterior margins of the bare area is called the coronary ligament. The anterior and posterior parts of the coronary ligament meet laterally to form the left and right triangular ligaments. The visceral surface of the liver is covered by peritoneum except in the fossa for the gallbladder and at the porta hepatis, which will be described in a moment. Structures in contact with the visceral surface form a pair of sagittal lines connected by a transverse line, producing a letter H, which helps demarcate another pair of anatomic lobes. The right sagittal line is formed anteriorly by the gallbladder and posteriorly by the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is partially embedded in the bare area of the liver. The left sagittal line is formed anteriorly by the ligamentum teres and posteriorly by the ligamentum venosum. If you've watched the Solid Anatomy lecture on circulation, you may recall that these structures are the remnants of the fetal umbilical vein and ductus venosus, respectively. Connecting these two sagittal lines is the transversely oriented porta hepatis. The portion of the liver between the inferior vena cava and the ligamentum venosum posterior to the porta hepatis is the caudate lobe, while the portion between the gallbladder and the ligamentum teres anterior to the porta hepatis is the quadrate lobe. 
The part of the lesser omentum between the liver and the stomach is called the hepatogastric ligament, while the part between the liver and the duodenum is called the hepatoduodenal ligament. Running in the hepatoduodenal ligament, which is the free edge of the lesser omentum that forms the superior part of the omental foramen, are three structures that compose the portal triad. Superiorly, the common bile duct lies to the right of the hepatic artery proper. Inferior to these two structures is the portal vein, which is sometimes called the hepatic portal vein. These structures enter the liver at the porta hepatis. Would you be surprised if I told you that the liver is a gland? And not only that, but that the liver is the second largest organ in the body? And even more remarkably, that the largest organ in the body is the skin? I'll tell you, we human beings are just full of surprises. And so are our livers. The liver is considered to be a gland because it manufactures and secretes bile, a fluid involved in the digestion and absorption of dietary fat and fat-soluble vitamins. But that's not all the liver does. It also stores glycogen and converts it to glucose when the body requires energy. It is responsible for metabolic detoxification, that is, breaking down potentially toxic substances in the bloodstream. And it produces a remarkable amount of lymph. The capsule of the liver, which is called Glisson's capsule, is often described as fibroelastic and consists of a thin layer of collagen and fibroblasts. Extensions of the capsule dive into the liver, forming incomplete walls between the functional units of the liver, the hepatic lobules. The lobules, which are roughly hexagonal in cross-section, consist of rows of hepatocytes, sometimes referred to as hepatic cords, radially arranged around a central vein, which ultimately drains into a hepatic vein. At the corners of the lobules are hepatic triads, which consist of an interlobar bile duct, which carries bile to the hepatic ducts, a branch of the portal vein, which brings nutrient-rich, partially deoxygenated blood into the liver from the digestive tract, and a branch of one of the hepatic arteries, which carry oxygenated blood into the liver. The branches of the portal vein and the hepatic artery in the hepatic triad deliver blood to capillary-like structures called sinusoids that run between the hepatic cords and ultimately drain into the central vein. The walls of the sinusoids are fenestrated, that is, there are large pores in their endothelial linings. These pores, or fenestrations, lead to spaces between the hepatocytes and the sinusoids that are collectively referred to as the space of Dissy. Plasma from the blood in the sinusoids passes through the fenestrations to fill the space of Dissy. This plasma provides nutrients and oxygen to the hepatocytes, and the hepatocytes perform metabolic detoxification on the plasma. Most of this plasma returns to the sinusoids and is dumped into the central vein. But some collects in lymphatic vessels, ultimately representing a significant percentage of the body's lymph. The hepatic sinusoids also contain macrophages that trap bacteria and remove foreign substances from the blood, and natural killer cells that destroy malignant cells in the blood. Let's take a moment to review the flow of blood through the liver. Oxygenated blood enters the liver via hepatic arteries, while poorly oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood from the digestive tract enters the liver via the portal vein. Terminal branches of these vessels deliver this blood to the sinusoids. 
Some of the blood plasma is converted to lymph, while the remainder of the blood is cleaned by macrophages and natural killer cells in the sinusoids and through metabolic detoxification by the hepatocytes. The cleaned blood enters the central veins of the hepatic lobules, which ultimately drain into one of three hepatic veins. The hepatic veins drain into the inferior vena cava, which returns the clean blood to the heart. Bile is important to the human body for two main reasons. One is that it prepares dietary fat for digestion by emulsifying it, meaning it breaks it down into smaller particles that may be digested by pancreatic enzymes. And two, it is responsible for cholesterol homeostasis. Not only do hepatocytes convert cholesterol into bile, but excess cholesterol may be solubilized in the bile and excreted in the feces. The gallbladder is a hollow organ that is often described as pear-shaped. The gallbladder occupies a fossa on the visceral surface of the liver to the right of the ligamentum teres. In this fossa, the serosa of the gallbladder blends with Glisson's capsule of the liver, anchoring the gallbladder to the liver. Peritoneum covers the gallbladder except for the part in contact with the liver. The epithelium of the mucosal layer consists of simple columnar cells that have microvilli on their surface. Anteriorly, the gallbladder has a rounded, expanded end, or fundus, and progressively narrows posteriorly into a body, a neck, and an infundibulum that leads to the cystic duct. The cystic duct merges with the common hepatic duct to form the common bile duct, a component of the portal triad, which is not to be confused with the aforementioned hepatic triad or the porta hepatis. The cystic duct crosses the posterior side of the horizontal portion of the duodenum and descends along the posterior side of the head of the pancreas. There is a sphincter at the end of the common bile duct the cholidocal sphincter, that is involved in the control of the release of bile, which will be discussed in a moment. The liver and gallbladder work in concert with the pancreas to deliver bile and digestive enzymes to the duodenum. Welcome back. Let's talk about some clinically important situations associated with the appendix and the colon. Let's start with the appendix. Obviously, one of the most common clinical problems related to the appendix is appendicitis. Now, itis means inflammation, not necessarily infection. If you have inflammation of the bronchial tree, that's bronchitis. If you have inflammation of the sinuses, that's sinusitis. So inflammation of the appendix is appendicitis. So appendicitis is where the lumen of the appendix becomes occluded, and then it becomes inflamed. Now, the obstruction, the occlusion can be caused by lymphoid hyperplasia in children or in adults by fibroid bands, by little hard rock-like pieces of stool called fecoliths, literally feces stones. Nice, huh? The classic presentation of acute appendicitis, and this answers the first clinical correlation question in your study guide. The classic presentation is dull periumbilical pain followed by nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. And then the pain gradually gets worse and it moves to the right lower quadrant, to an area we call McBurney's Point. Now, McBurney's Point is located in the right lower quadrant, one-third of the way from the ASIS to the umbilicus. Or another way to say the same thing would be two-thirds of the way from the umbilicus to the ASIS. So you need to remember McBurney's Point, but realize that this pain can often be periumbilical at the beginning. It's near the umbilicus. This is because the afferent pain fibers enter the spinal cord at T10 which innervates the umbilicus. Now, appendicitis can also cause fever. It can cause rebound tenderness due to peritoneal irritation. Rebound tenderness is where you press deeply on the patient's abdomen, and when you release that pressure, the abdominal ball rebounds, carrying the peritoneum with it, that causes some pain. That's rebound tenderness. Uh, you can also have psoas sign, which is where you have the patient lie on his side, and you passively pull the thigh back at the hip, extending the thigh and stretching the psoas muscles. And if this causes some abdominal pain, that's called a positive psoas sign because that right iliopsoas muscles are located just posterior to the appendix. 
Patients with appendicitis can also have something called Rovsing's sign, which is where you get right lower quadrant pain when you palpate the left lower quadrant. There's also the obturator sign, which is right lower quadrant pain on passive internal rotation of a flexed hip. So you have the patient supine, they're lying down on their back, you flex the hip to about 90 degrees, then you rotate the hip internally by pushing medially on the knee, pulling the ankle laterally, that's going to internally rotate the hip. And if that obturator test uh, on the right side causes pain, that's called a positive obturator sign, and that could indicate appendicitis. And then if there's perforation of the appendix and subsequent peritonitis, there's going to be severe abdominal pain and abdominal distension with rebound tenderness and abdominal rigidity and guarding. And with perforation, they're classically going to have a very high fever, greater than 103 degrees Fahrenheit. There may also be hypotension or shock. So that's appendicitis. Let's also consider the colon for a moment. One clinical entity you should be aware of with the colon is called a volvulus. So a volvulus is a rotation of the bowel creating obstruction and possibly ischemia if it twists around the arteries and twists those arteries closed. Now, volvulus can technically occur anywhere in the bowel, but it most commonly occurs at the cecum and in the sigmoid colon. It tends to occur in the elderly and also in infants. The patient's going to present with abdominal distension, abdominal pain, vomiting, obstipation, which is very severe constipation, which you can imagine if you've rotated the, the colon so much that it obstructs. You might also be able to palpate an abdominal mass. And then how do we treat a volvulus? Well, a lot of times it's self-limited. It's going to go away on its own. Sometimes just doing a colonoscopy can actually untwist a sigmoid volvulus, and then surgical repair or resection may be required if that colonoscopic detorsion doesn't work, or if you have a sequel volvulus, you might have to do surgery. All right, let's get back to Dr. Phelan. The pancreas is a secondarily retroperitoneal organ found posterior to the stomach in the floor of the lesser sac. It is transversely oriented, and its shape has been likened to that of such distinct objects as a feather and a banana. Its rounded head is surrounded by the descending and horizontal parts of the duodenum, while its tail lies anterior to the left kidney and points toward the hilum of the spleen. The neck of the pancreas is the portion that crosses anterior to the superior mesenteric vessels, an extension from the inferior aspect of the head, the uncinate process, projects superiorly and to the left between the aorta, which is posterior to it, and the superior mesenteric vessels, which are anterior to it. Between the neck and the tail, the body of the pancreas runs in parallel with the splenic vein, which is often partially embedded in its posterior side. The superior mesenteric and splenic vessels will be discussed shortly. The pancreas is a gland, but not just an average gland, it is two glands in one. It is an exocrine gland that delivers digestive enzymes to the duodenum via a duct and it is an endocrine gland that delivers hormones involved in carbohydrate metabolism to the bloodstream. The endocrine cells, which only account for about 2% of the mass of the pancreas, form irregular clusters within the pancreas called islets of Langerhans. Three main types of cells make up the islets. The alpha cells, which secrete glucagon, the beta cells, which secrete insulin, and the delta cells, which secrete somatostatin. The islets are abundantly vascularized with fenestrated capillaries, poised to carry these hormones into the circulation. The functional unit of the exocrine portion of the gland is the acinus. A pancreatic acinus is composed of a group of acinar cells that are arranged in a cluster resembling a raspberry. Acinus, indeed, is the Latin word for berry. In the middle of the acinus is a lumen, which is connected to the smallest vessels in the pancreatic ductal system, the intercalated ducts. The main pancreatic duct passes through the head of the organ and approaches the duodenum. 
the common bile duct, enters the substance of the pancreas through the posterior side of its head and merges with the main pancreatic duct to form the hepatopancreatic ampulla, or ampulla of Vater. The ampulla penetrates the second portion of the duodenum and enters its lumen at the center of a circular elevated area called the major duodenal papilla. Here, the ampulla is surrounded by the sphincter of Odi. The accessory pancreatic duct opens into the duodenum superior to the major duodenal papilla through the minor duodenal papilla. When the duodenum is empty, the sphincter of Odi and the sphincter of the bile duct are closed. Bile produced by the liver passes through the common hepatic duct to the common bile duct, reaches the closed sphincter, and backs up through the cystic duct to enter the gallbladder. The bile is stored in the gallbladder until ingested food enters the duodenum. The spleen occupies the left hypochondriac region in relation posterolaterally with ribs 9, 10, and 11, and does not normally extend inferior to the costal margin. Despite being protected by the rib cage, the spleen, with its thin capsule and soft, pulpy interior, may be ruptured due to an increase in intra-abdominal pressure from a blow to the abdomen. The spleen has a convex diaphragmatic surface and a flat visceral surface in contact with the left kidney, the stomach, and the splenic flexure of the colon. In the center of the visceral surface is the hilum, where blood vessels and lymphatics enter and exit the spleen. So that covers the part two lecture on the abdominal organs. Now I want you to pause the video and answer the intercession quiz questions, and then we're gonna go through those answers together. All right, let's get going. First question, which two ligaments compose the lesser omentum? That's the hepatogastric ligament and the hepatoduodenal ligament. Next, what are the components of the portal triad? So you have the proper hepatic artery, the hepatic portal vein, and the bile duct. Next, what's the functional unit of the exocrine pancreas? It's the acinus, which releases those digestive enzymes from the pancreas. Next, what are the clusters of pancreatic endocrine cells uh, made up of alpha, beta, and delta cells called? So again, those are called the islets of Langerhans. Next, what ligaments are the remnant of the fetal umbilical vein and the ductus venosus? So the ligamentum teres is the remnant of the fetal umbilical vein, and the ligamentum venosum is the remnant of the ductus venosus. And then finally, we've provided some images for you to label in a time setting in the mock practical. So label those images, then you'll be finished. Thanks.